Welcome to the Center Collaborative, Creative Solutions in Behavioral Health and Criminal Justice, brought to you by the Oregon Center on Behavioral Health and Justice Integration, which is also known as the Center. We at the Center are all about solutions. Our job in Oregon is to facilitate improvement of the system so behavioral health and criminal justice can work better together to engage people in treatment while promoting public safety. I am your host, Chris Thomas. I hold a master's degree in clinical psychology and have focused on the intersection between behavioral health and criminal justice for 20 years. Over seven of those years were behind the walls of a maximum security prison. During this podcast, you will have the opportunity to sit in on real, in-depth conversations with experts about complex topics in a way that is both fascinating and digestible. We will focus not just on what is wrong with the system, but what is going right and how we can work together to evolve. This podcast is a conversation in a series of conversations where we touch on people's legal rights and their options related to seeking medical care. Since our conversations are intended for informational and educational purposes only, they are not a substitute for or a reason to delay seeking professional legal or medical advice. Today on the podcast, I am joined by Terry Schroeder, OHA Operation and Policy Analyst for the Certification and Licensure Department, and Jeffrey Gray, PhD, Licensed Psychologist. We talk about the role of the mental health examiner as a clarifier and a questioner for the court, not just as an expert witness, and how that provides clarification around clinical aspects of a civil commitment hearing. We also talk about how this role is helpful to the judge, and we talk about changes in the law regarding inability to care, as well as the role of intent, impulsivity, and the person's relationship to their symptoms when determining dangerousness. By the way, Jeff asked me to call him Jeff throughout the podcast, so you'll hear me call him Jeff instead of Dr. Gray. I learned so much from my conversation with Terry and Jeff. I think you'll enjoy hearing our conversation, too. Welcome to our conversation. Today on the podcast, I have with us to chat Terry Schroeder, Operation and Policy Analyst for the Certification and Licensing Department at the Oregon Health Authority, or if you want the short version for his title, the Civil Commitment Coordinator, and also Dr. Jeffrey Gray, Licensed Clinical Psychologist. Jeff and Terry, it is wonderful to have you on the podcast today. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you. Good to be here. Good to be here. We had such a positive response to the podcast with Terry about the civil commitment process last season that we chatted with Terry about coming back on the podcast for a more focused conversation and to bring in Jeff around the role of the examiner. So, Terry, before we get going, though, can we just remind the listening audience around the role of the examiner and provide some framework? Absolutely. The examiner role is somewhat of a unique role in the civil commitment world in the state of Oregon compared to other states. Many other states don't have a third party examiner role in the civil commitment hearings. And so that I think is something that we should highlight is that Oregon does this a little bit differently and adds another layer of advice and consultation to the court during civil commitment processes, and that's the examiner role that we're talking about today. So I'm really glad to have Jeff with us to talk about that. I've worked with Jeff for many years, uh, very impressed with his expertise, his role, his professionalism in the courtroom. It really does elevate the conversation when you have an examiner who is experienced and very clear about their role in the court setting. So the examiner is a certified position that is engaged by the court when a civil commitment hearing is being recommended by the investigator, who we talked about in our last podcast. And so once that investigative report is filed with the court, one of the next things that the court does is engage an examiner to provide an independent evaluation of the individual who's being recommended for civil commitment. And that examiner then has a very short period of time, because this is on judicial day three that the investigative report is filed. And then by judicial day five, two more days is when the court hearing is to be scheduled and take place. 
So the investigator is notified of the court hearing on judicial day three and is then involved in the process of beginning the preliminary evaluation and understanding who that person is. That includes receiving the investigative report, scheduling time to see the individual, and then also preparing for the court hearing. It's during the court hearing that the investigator does the primary amount of its work, and I'll let Jeff talk about that piece. The examiner is, as I said, certified through us. They have to meet a different set of qualifications than the investigator, and that's somewhat reflective, well, pretty much reflective of the added layer of responsibility that the examiner has over the investigator. So, for example, the examiner has to have at least three years of work in the treatment of people with serious and persistent mental illnesses. And the reason for that is is that in the courtroom, the examiner has the responsibility of providing an opinion to the court as to whether or not this person does or does not have a mental health diagnosis, what that diagnosis is, and whether or not it qualifies as a serious and persistent mental illness. That's important for a number of reasons, one of which has to do with what's called the expanded criteria or the chronically mentally ill piece to the evaluation in the courtroom. And that has to do with the ability to provide an opinion to the court as to whether or not that criteria is being met. And it's a four-piece criteria, one of which is the diagnosis of a serious and persistent mental illness. And so the examiner has to weigh in on that and also as to whether or not, based on their evaluation of the person, whether or not that individual is meeting the other criteria, which essentially is that their current circumstances are are of a similar nature to what resulted in previous placements for that person, and also whether or not that individual is able to voluntarily agree to be in treatment or not, and also whether or not they feel like those circumstances result in a dangerousness and of what type because of the mental disorder that they've evaluated. So that's more than what the investigator is expected to provide testimony to the court about. In addition, the examiner has the opportunity to cross-examine witnesses as they testify in the court hearing. That is something the investigator does not do. And that ultimately results in an opinion that the examiner provides to the court as to whether or not the clear and convincing bar has been met, which is a criteria for civil commitment. At the end, the examiner provides a summation to the court as to whether or not the state has met its burden, in their opinion, as to whether or not the person should be civilly committed, for what reasons, and then also recommendations going forth. That's just a very short kind of summation of a very complex process that the examiner has to go through in a very short, condensed period of time, like I said. It starts on judicial day three, and most of the work and most of that process happens during the court hearing itself because the time limit for the examiner to interview the person is often very contracted. Sometimes they only get to see that person for maybe 45 minutes to an hour prior to the hearing. And so that interview process is very short, and you have to go by your medical history and the interview with the person plus what you witness and hear during the courtroom, which is really where most of the rich information about what your opinion is going to be comes through. Just to make sure that I am clear and then the listeners are clear. So the examiner has a very different role, it sounds like, than what folks are used to in a court process. So most of the time, it sounds like in a court process, at least what we all think of when we think of a court process, is that you have witnesses that come in and provide testimony, and their testimony is pretty much set. But the examiner, it's a different role than what you're used to with a witness. They're forming their opinion during the hearing and also able to ask questions of folks, what one would think of legal counsel, but of course they're not legal counsel. Am I wrapping my brain around that correctly? Yeah, that's correct. They're essentially an independent third party clinical person providing clarification for the court around the elements necessary to decide whether or not the civil commitment is appropriate. And so you're right. They function in a very unique way as far as court hearings go and are considered expert witnesses as well as consultants of sorts. In fact, you might even say that they are working for the court during the hearing and they are not to have an agenda prior to the 
process. So they're not working for the state and they're not working for the defense. It's an independent evaluation that the court's looking for them to provide. That's exactly right. The examiner operates as a friend to the court. The opinions that are offered can be accepted, agreed with, or rejected and dismissed. I will take up the issue, though, Terry, there's some controversy about this. Whether or not a non-legal or a not the trier of fact, an expert witness, is able to offer a legal opinion. Mm -hmm. So this is where I, I think some of the distinctions should be made. The examiner's role, I believe, is we're always asked to give an opinion about whether a mental illness exists and what the repercussions are in terms of safety and health. But the ultimate decision lies with the trier of fact and whether I think the evidence meets the bar of clear and convincing or not doesn't really matter. And many people would say it's not my role to make that distinction. It's my role to provide the information as I see it short of making a legal decision. Mm -hmm. So I'm making clinical recommendations, not making a legal finding. And, and that's important to distinguish. So it's sounding like for the court and for the judge, having the examiner there is really the opportunity to have a clinician in court who is able to form an opinion while they're listening to not only all the prior information that they looked at before, but everything that is happening in court. So it's really the opportunity for an interactive clinician opinion in court for them to make that legal call versus usually with an expert witness coming in and saying, this is my opinion, but there really isn't a lot of opportunity for back and forth and for the clinician to be able to ask folks to get more information for their clinical opinion. In my experience, there's absolutely that opportunity, whether the particular judge in question takes that opportunity or how they think they're supposed to conduct the, the hearing is really what determines what happens. Another way of thinking about this, too, is that the examiner's role is to, in my view, is to clarify for the judge certain elements of that person's presentation. And there can be a conversation back and forth between the judge and the examiner, say, for example, the examiner may ask certain questions of the individual, and then the judge may ask questions of the examiner to clarify their thinking about what those questions represent. And so there's a back and forth that can happen that way. Or the judge, based on what the examiner has asked, may ask the individual another clarifying question. But the goal is to clarify and to make more direct where the evidence exists and where the evidence is more speculative and trying to tease out those kinds of things with what is generally a very complex situation and also very different kinds of presentations in the courtroom for the individual and with what the witnesses say as well. I think Terry's absolutely right about that. So this comes back to the definition of the role of the examiner. So as, as the examiner, you're aligned with the court. And hopefully you're working in tandem for the same purpose, not necessarily the same outcome, but for the same purpose. And that is to explicate what is known about the case, to fill in gaps that might not be addressed in the investigator's report or by previous testimony, if you can. What would you want the court to know about the role of the examiner? One of the things that's been helpful in this pandemic is I've been able to separate out the certification training for the examiners. And one of the things that has benefited from that is the examiners getting to talk to one another in the different kind of court environments that they experience across the state. And there is a lot of variability from one judge to another, one court to another in terms of their understanding and relationship with their examiners as they approach these hearings. One of the things that I hear from the examiners pretty consistently is their desire to be active in that process of clarifying and understanding how the mental disorder is presenting in this particular case and being able to provide the court with clarification as to how that mental disorder may or may not result in risk that does or doesn't meet the criteria. And one of the things I 
encourage in all cases is for the examiner to be as active as the court would like them to be in those hearings. And I would like to encourage the court to utilize the examiners to their utmost ability in terms of providing them with clarification around those issues. Because one of the real challenges in these kinds of cases, and these aren't criminal cases, these are civil cases, is to try to get to know who this person is in front of the court in terms of how they are experiencing their mental disorder, what kind of behaviors that results in, and helping the the court understand how behaviors are reflective of a mental disorder that they may be witnessing. And so there's an educational quality that the examiner plays throughout this whole process that I think is a huge advantage for the court when they take full advantage of it. The other thing that I would say, too, is that these clarifications, as they become testimony, become part of the court record. And those clarifications, when they become important, when an appellate court is reviewing an appeal of a civil commitment, that testimony becomes more apparent as to how the court came to its conclusions. And so, therefore, the appellate court has more material to work with, better understand how the court came to that determination, which results in the appellate court being able to make better decisions about whether or not to reverse or to uphold a civil commitment. And you'll see that in the appellate court rulings, they will say very directly that if this has not been entered into evidence directly, we have to then make assumptions about how the court came to its conclusions. And therefore, we are in that position, we are almost always going to side in the favor of the appellate and reverse these cases. So it strengthens the ability for the appellate court to make decisions in a more clear fashion when there is more clarity in the courtroom in terms of testimony. And that often comes from the examiner being more active in the process. Yeah, I agree with everything that you just said, Terry. The examiner, depending on the judge, may be in a position where they have to insert themselves in the proceedings. It's clear early on, once they've asked for direct and and cross-examination, whether or not they have in mind that they'll include the examiner as a question asker. And if they don't, and if it happens to be a witness that I do have questions for, that's the time when I'll insert myself. I've also known for counsel to insert themselves at that point as well and say, Dr. Gray may have some questions as well. And from there, the stage is set. Oftentimes, the questions that I try to ask will either clarify points that have already been made or expand upon what I consider are the important issues of an individual's testimony. And then at times will be somewhat exploratory depending on who the witness is. And again, the examiner purpose is neither to side with either county counsel or defense. It's to inform the court. So, Jeff, could you give some examples of what kind of issues or questions that you're clarifying or informing the court around and how that's helpful to the court and for the judge making that decision? Certainly. So clarification can come, say, from the investigator in terms of why a diagnostic category is being considered, what the symptom clusters that have been observed have been, what the changes over time that have been observed may be. It's a short period of time, typically, unless there's postponements, which can come up. Oftentimes, a person comes into the system through emergency services and are started on medications that may have an effect in in the short run, may have an impact by the time of hearing. So the investigator, as I say, the more thorough the investigator's report has been, particularly in terms of delineating the psychiatric history, delineating the individual's recent past. And I can't define for you how far back a recent past can or should go in the consideration of the individual's current mental state. And the current mental state 
is really what's at issue in this kind of a hearing. Past episodes of mental illness may be informative on several levels, but may not be completely relevant. And and it's often left to the judge to decide what kind of historical information can or should be considered. From a clinician standpoint, I want as much of that as I can get. It helps inform diagnosis. It helps inform predictions of future behavior as well. Typically with law enforcement, my primary questioning has to do with tangible, observable signs of physical dangerousness, trying to get that established. More often than not, the individual sitting in the hearing room, by the time we get to hearing, tends to be calm and quiet throughout most of it. If an individual is disruptive, that in of itself informs the court, and my job's a lot easier. But that's usually not the case. The danger to themselves or others or is unable to care for their basic needs, that's the more challenging and difficult part of this. Once the testimony of the investigator has, in my thinking, adequately demonstrated how compelling the evidence is for a mental health diagnosis, then usually that doesn't necessarily have to be elaborated upon for the court's edification. And a lot of that can just come in the form of the investigator's report. And my hat goes off to the investigators. I think they have the hardest job in the courtroom. Uh, And they're under immense time pressure to gather a lot of diverse information and make critical decisions uh, in a very short period of time. So one would expect that that there would be some gaps in the investigator's report that can hopefully fill in by witness testimony at hearing. So law enforcement, I'm looking for largely their observations of a person's behavior at the time of contact. I would also take that same track with other witnesses. I don't like to keep family members under questioning for any longer than I have to, because I believe that's a fraught situation. I I know that family members often have a need to be able to speak and to inform the court as to what they've experienced and what their fears are uh, about the future for their loved one and for others as well. But there's typically not going to be a lot of questioning that I'll do unless questions of actual statements of threats of harm to self or others hasn't been addressed. I'm going to want to to question uh, witnesses of that. Have you heard this person say such and such? And that can be compelling. If I get a chance to interview the examinee in the hearing, I am going to inform the court of my past interactions with with that individual. And I, as much as possible, try to examine the individual one-to-one, not in a public setting, prior to the hearing. And as Terry pointed out, there's a pretty small window that you have to do that. And where that person is being held prior to the hearing makes a big difference in terms of accessibility. If I'm asked to do a hearing far enough away that making a separate trip to do an examination isn't feasible, ask if I can talk to that person just before hearing, in the half hour or 45 minutes before. That's not really as much time as I'd like to spend in doing the examination. Oftentimes, I take about an hour and a half if I have that much latitude in order to inform the examinee as to my role, to let them know that I'm not working for them, that I'm not working for the county, and I'm working for the court, and that I will be essentially an advisor to the court, a friend of the court. And oftentimes that is probably the most important thing I say in terms of whether I am successful in gaining the individual's cooperation. And it's not guaranteed. And if an individual does not want to be examined by me, I terminate the examination. But if, if I 
do have access to that individual. And if I have some time, I will use that just to get to know them some, develop some kind of rapport with them, ask them questions about how they came to be at the hospital, ask them questions about what they understand they've been diagnosed with or why they're there. I will have the investigator's report before I do that. So I already have a little bit background on the case itself. And the examinee should have had a, a copy of the report as well by the time I get there, plus other court documentation. I can ask them for their responses or reactions to things that are contained in the report. And what I'm looking for in many of those cases is not just their accounts of things, but also how their thought processes are, are unfolding, how stable their mood is, how reactive they are to portions of the information that's being presented. It's a short examination. I'll try to do a mental status examination if they're agreeable and cooperative with that, and that can be very helpful. Some of the information I get mental status-wise occurs later on in the hearing, simply through observation. And how their behavior in adhering compares to their behavior when meeting them on an individual basis. I do not like to conduct my examinations in the courtroom or in the hearing room. I believe that is a situation that th there's just too many uncontrolled variables with everybody sitting around and what the gravity of the situation is. If, if I can avoid that, I certainly will. I appreciate the sensitivity that you have around chatting with family and making sure that families' voices are heard, but also the sensitivity around how difficult that process is for family and also for the person that the whole hearing is about, that your respect around explaining what your role is, really taking that time and trying to do that in private instead of in front of the court because it's such an intrusive situation for a person. So being able to have that respect and being really sensitive to that. So I just want to highlight and appreciate that. Thanks for saying that. I am curious. We talk a lot about dangerousness, either to self or others. And I do want to talk about that bar because I know that there's a lot of discussion around where that bar is, particularly in Oregon. But what we don't talk about very often is if someone is able to care for their basic needs, or it used to be called grave disability, and I know there's been some changes around that in recent years, and I'm wondering if you all could talk about that piece in particular, and then we can go back to dangerousness, but we just generally don't talk about that piece of it on being able to take care of yourself. Be happy to, and I also want to reflect a, a similar sentiment that Chris mentioned in terms of Jeff's approach to these interviews both inside and outside of the courtroom. This is one of the things that I, I have a great respect for Jeff and other examiners who approach it with this kind of a multi-layered sensitivity. And he gives a good example, I think, of how complex what these interventions or these interactions can be in terms of observing both how that person is, how the relationship is to their own illness, how they understand their context or their circumstances, and also the need to preserve relationships that are supportive of that individual, which involves the family members, et cetera. And being aware and conscious of all those things within the context of, in which these evaluations occur is an art form. And it takes a lot of years of training and experience to be able to do that in such a fluent and efficient way, and yet at the same time be approachable and real so that you do have uh, a sense of somebody who is somebody that you're going to be willing to speak with and also respect your results or, or what's being said about you. In addition to that, it also reflects the credibility the court's going to have for that examiner and how they approach themselves, how they conduct themselves, how they comport themselves in that process. All of that matters in terms of the credibility that the examiner is going to have and I think plays a role in how active the examiner is invited to be in the courtroom, too. These are all very important pieces, which is why I uh, recommended Jeff for this podcast, as I think he exemplifies that in so many different ways. So the inability to care criteria has changed in statutory language. 
in around 2015 and then was reviewed by the appellate court a couple of years later in a case called the MAE case versus uh, Multnomah County, I believe it was. And in that particular case, there was an individual who appealed their recommitment at the state hospital. And the issue was around inability to care. What resulted from that appellate court review and ruling was that the language had changed significantly enough to change the way in which inability to care cases can be reviewed by the court. And the specific examples around that are in the language of the statute, which first speaks to the individual's inability to care as a result of a mental disorder may result in a serious injury to that person. And so the appellate court went about discerning between the old language and the new language of serious injury. And their conclusion was essentially was that a serious injury can include many different kinds of possible injuries to that person that may not result in death in the near future, which was the old standard, but that the person may experience some sort of a medical problem. For example, if someone doesn't take their diabetic medications for type 1 diabetes, that may result in any number of medical complications, which will result in serious injury to that person over a period of time. And that's the second piece that the appellate court looked at is the wording of in the near future versus immediate. That too changed the perspective of the court in terms of now we are looking at somebody who may be experiencing some form of injury that the usually that testimony usually comes from a medical provider who will describe and define what a serious injury may be resulting from either not attending to a particular medical concern or engaging in behaviors that may result in a particular kind of injury. Each case has its own nuanced differences around that, which again, the examiner plays a role in helping clarify how those two things are connected through their questioning of the medical person in the courtroom if there might be holes and gaps of information that way. But the near future was defined by the appellate court as a case-by-case basis, but generally speaking, could expand out into what would be a reasonable computation of time in that particular case. So you could go anywhere from a few days to a few weeks, depending on the dynamics of that particular person's circumstances. So it's a much broader time frame and a more broad perspective of what a serious injury may be. And this, I think, is a very important change in the language, because in the past, this is probably, from my point of view, one of the most difficult cases to successfully go through for a civil commitment in the past, prior to this appellate court ruling and the change in language. And what that also meant is we often saw people suffering from serious mental disorders who were not caring for their basic needs and were suffering a great deal, but because of our previous understanding of what the criteria was to promote a civil commitment for the protection of that individual was so limiting that we had to wait until the situation deteriorated so far that there was a significant risk to that person's health and safety. And I'm not just talking hospitalization, I'm talking possibly dying from it, that we could take action, which seemed very hard to understand. And this is, again, why this language change happened to allow us to be more responsive to the needs of a person who was deteriorating in that fashion, as long as we had an appropriate medical decision or determination that this risk was present and real. And so it does rely on a medical decision or a medical uh, opinion to the court. But again, this is part of what the examiner's role is to make sure that the court is getting from that medical person the information necessary for the court to decide whether or not that criteria is met. If you, either one of you, could give an example of a case where the old bar would have been with immediate, right, death versus where it is now and how the change in that allowed there to be intervention earlier. I'm wondering, instead of talking about it in theory, I'm wondering if there's an example you can think of that would make it a little bit more clear for our listeners, the difference. The MAE case where this appellate court case was based on would be one example of that. So, for example, in this particular case, this individual's mental disorder causes her to be uh, highly suspicious, paranoid, if you will, about the food and fluids that she's offered. Um, 
primarily because of her mental disorder, she believed that she was being poisoned, both through her food and through her fluids. And therefore, without significant ongoing supervision, support, and medications to manage her illness, she would not accept food or fluids. In the old way of understanding this, what would have had to have happened is she would have been allowed to be discharged out into the streets. Then the general prediction and history for this individual is that she would stop taking her medications as a result of that. Her illness would then become more active and she would have more breakthrough symptoms of paranoia in addition to other kinds of behaviors that caused her to not be able to access certain services like shelters and homeless places. So she would be now houseless and on the streets without any support services. Her illness would be such that she would reject all of that. In addition to that, she would also not be eating or taking fluids. And the question then would become, at what point does her medical condition deteriorate to the where an intervention could take place. In the old way of understanding that, she would have to be basically dehydrated where she would be brought into an ER, lab tests would be done, and she would be shown to be basically close to non-responsive due to a lack of food and due to a lack of hydration. In other words, close to death because of this new ruling allows for that understanding to be present without those injuries to actually take full effect. So a demonstration of that tendency to go in that direction is enough to begin to consider civil commitment as an appropriate action, as opposed to waiting to see that injury in its full form occur. The phrase that stuck out to me, Terry, was non-speculative risk. And that's, in my thinking, going to be the determination of, of the judge. So the old language that I'm familiar with, Terry, and I don't know if this was from civil commitment or from other areas of the law, was immediate and imminent mm-hmm. when we were talking about risk. That's correct. And th- that always seemed very restrictive in the sense of immediate means right now and imminent means there's no two ways about it. Mm-hmm. That was a very high bar to, to meet. And this language allows for less certainty and less immediacy and covers many more situations, as Terry was saying. It sounds like, though, it is still a pretty high bar. So I just want to make sure that we're talking about that, too. It needs to be that there's obviously something going to happen or likely to happen versus just being worried that something might happen. Yeah, and this speaks to the development of the foundation of that ability to make that kind of a statement. And when I say foundation, I'm talking about the medical history of that person in the recent past, as well as in the the more distant past, that shows a pattern of behavior as a result, again, of the mental disorder. This cannot be a choice-based situation where an individual has a conscious understanding of the consequences and is not as a result of their mental disorder. So that has to be distinguished. A person can choose to not eat and to not take fluids for any number of reasons. We are only talking about that small, narrow group of folks who are suffering from a mental disorder that basically takes away from them their ability to understand the consequences of their behaviors in one fashion or another. And so that's part of the distinction that has to be made for the court before they can go with this kind of a ruling for commitment. And so that's part of it. The other part is that this information has to be provided by a medical professional who has a non-speculative point of view. And again, not one of concern that this may happen at some point in the future, and we don't know when or why or how it's going to occur, but we are concerned that it may happen. And so there's still a number of people who will not fit within this guideline that we are concerned about. But that's because we don't have the facts or the evidence to support in a non-speculative way what's going to happen in that near future period of time. So it it is still narrow, but it is not as narrow and or restrictive as it has been in the past. The other phrase that stood out for me, which seems to have changed, is that putting oneself in harm's way was one of those speculative predictions. And that often came up in cases where issues of homelessness and or substance abuse were present. And the speculations would often be that an individual's choices and or circumstances under which they may find themselves in dangerous situations 
Terry, I would ask for your comments on that. Is putting oneself in harm's way, is, is that an acceptable standard at this point? Not in and of itself or by itself. And the appellate courts have been really clear in reviewing the legislative intent around the civil commitment statutes that they're not intended for all of the folks who make decisions that maybe we're uncomfortable with and or struggle from addictions specifically, that nobody would really disagree that a severe addiction is not going to result in some form of harm to somebody who's going through that. Addictions are very destructive to individuals, families, society, etc. Nobody's really going to argue with that. However, these statutes for civil commitment are designed really to very specifically be addressed for those individuals with serious and persistent mental illnesses, which again goes all the way back to one of the criteria that an examiner has to be skilled and knowledgeable about is how is that defined and who does that apply to? And if that is the case, then these statutes might apply. So these statutes are not designed to address all of the societal ills and and difficulties that we have going on. It gets to be messy and muddled as to at what point do we draw that line, right? Because it's also true that very frequently the individual that we see before the court in these matters do struggle with substance abuse issues. Substance abuse is oftentimes a part of the dynamic that potentially causes the risk, both in terms of the inflaming of a mental disorder and or the parroting of a mental disorder in terms of uh, the symptoms that they create and the risk that's resulting from those things. And that, again, is part of the investigator's role is to sort out primary and secondary diagnostic issues around that along with the medical team that's treating that person. So hopefully when the individual does come in front of a court That has been fairly well figured out to some degree so that the court is basically working with a question in regard to a person who does have a significant mental disorder. And it's that mental disorder that's causing the impairment in judgment, insight, and impulse control that's resulting in the risk. And it's the examiner who provides an opinion around those factors to the judge, or at least observations for the judge to help understand. Along that line, Terry, what is the current rulings as far as whether a chronic substance abuse problem can be the designated mental disorder? For example, if you have an individual who has chronic alcoholism and periodically puts themselves in harm's way, if you will, because of that, and there's no other demonstrable mental illness besides substance abuse, Is that allowed by statute in the civil commitment process? Once you said, and there is no other demonstrable mental disorder present, then I went a different direction from what I was going to say. (laughs) Uh, So uh, it is possible for a person with a chronic substance abuse issue to also have an ongoing mental disorder that is also present and active. And then the question then becomes, which is which? For example... Someone with a long history of alcoholism and then recovery for a period of number of years has a relapse on that alcohol. And as a result of that relapse, any number of issues start to come forward in terms of loss of relationship, loss of jobs, loss of home, all these losses that result from that relapse. That may result in a major depressive disorder that moves that person towards a suicidal journey. That could be somebody potentially who would be able to be civilly committed if the circumstances were right and that person was adamant about that suicidal journey and through that depressive disorder. So you would have a secondary or a primary mental disorder that's driving the risk, even though there's that history of substance use and recent substance abuse. So in that respect, the court says each case should be addressed on its own merits and its own particular circumstances. It will also say, the appellate court will also say that if that is the primary and only disorder that is driving the behavior, then no, that is a disqualifying diagnostic group. So individuals who are without any other demonstrable mental disorders, as you say, not being present or not being diagnosed through the investigation process and the inpatient treatment evaluations, if they are not seeing or finding any other mental disorder present other than the substance abuse 
issues, then no. Those are really helpful clarifications, I think, particularly around someone continuing to use substances and the danger to themselves and them not being able to take care of themselves or being in a houseless situation and the factors that go along with that. And clarifying that within itself is not enough to hit the bar, I think is really important. Yeah. I get calls every day from family members who are concerned about their their person in their family who is experiencing houselessness, chronic substance abuse, is vulnerable in a number of different ways and have maybe experienced a number of different types of injuries as well. They don't see this going anywhere but in a downward spiral. And everything that they've tried to do to help has not succeeded yet. And they've looked at the civil commitment statutes and rules to be a possible lifeboat for them. And, And it's very difficult conversations that I have with these folks in terms of clarifying around that and providing them resources and referrals to the crisis teams, which still may be able to help in those circumstances, but they may not be able to use the civil commitment statutes to get that person in treatment. We might talk a little bit more about differential diagnosis and the role of the examiner there. And what I would want to offer for others is the idea that for the judge to make a ruling, it's important for the the judge to have clear and convincing evidence that a qualifying mental illness does exist. The specifics of that illness are probably less crucial. So in a situation where an individual is displaying cognitive disorientation or delusional ideation, that they have some mood instability, Determining the exact nature of that disorder, particularly if there's been multiple diagnoses in the past, is less critical than being able to inform the court that there are different possible diagnostic categories that have some overlapping features that may apply in the case. And whereas the differential diagnosis is more important in terms of determining a a path of treatment, in terms of determining civil commitment questions, this doesn't necessarily need to be established in my thinking. However, I think it's instructive to the court to simply point out that the specific diagnostic classification is as yet undetermined. And, And that's often the case and why Many providers are using either the the language of falling on a spectrum or providing a diagnosis that is intentionally vague, like a psychotic disorder not otherwise specified. And those diagnostic categories qualify without the burden of having to delineate further exactly what that disorder is. I'm curious if part of that is because it's such a short timeline and that there could be so many diagnoses in the past, that it's about establishing that there is a condition there that would meet criteria for case law and statute, plus the issues around dangerousness and not being able to care. And that is where the burden is, less on what the specific diagnosis is. Is that why it can be a little bit more vague in the court process? Yeah, not only the time that is allowed for your own investigation and trying to discover the facts, but because some conditions are susceptible to multiple interpretations uh, and multiple diagnoses. And even a person who has been treated over a period of years, there may be some controversy over the specific diagnosis that best fits Uh, situation. And sometimes people get changes in diagnostics throughout the, the period of treatment. My point being is that I think that the court needs to understand what the symptoms uh, are that are present as opposed to being able to specifically classify those symptoms as long as the examiner helps the judge understand that there are symptoms, both in the cognitive and the affective domains, that is what's crucial for, I think, the trier of fact to make that decision. So it's more about the gestalt of symptoms and what they look like and how that contributes to risk? 
Yes. Yeah, I think getting back to those issues of are the symptoms serious? And, and when we're talking about serious, we're talking about what are the functional impairments that are the result of these symptoms, both in terms of cognitive, affective, behavioral, understanding uh, risk factors in terms of understanding of their circumstances, whether or not they're being compelled to take action from delusional kinds of instructions. Do they demonstrate any insight into their illness in such a way that they are able to resist those compulsions? Are they able to seek help or not? Or does their illness prevent them from being able to do that? In other words, what level of risk do these symptoms cause this person to find themselves in? And then are they going to persist? That's the other piece that's important to connect to together. So again, I agree that the diagnostic nuances are not as important to the court as to how serious are these symptoms in terms of functional limitations, and also will they persist over time so that this action being taken of a civil commitment of 180 days is necessary to protect that individual and to protect society. Because if these symptoms are due to a brief use of substances that are not going to persist over time unless the person uses again, then that's going to be a disqualifying pattern, so to speak, versus somebody with a schizoaffective disorder or a bipolar disorder with manic symptoms. In either case, they both have serious functional limitations and they do persist over time. And that can be established through the medical record as well as the person's presentation during the inpatient period of time prior to the hearing. So that's more important for the court, I think, than the diagnostic distinctions to be made. I'm noticing that we're getting towards the end of our time. I'm wondering if we want to also talk about dangerousness a little bit. We haven't really chatted about that much, either danger to self or danger to others. And if you all have any thoughts about that, that you'd want the court to know, particularly in the role of the examiner. As far as making a risk assessment of dangerousness, Typically, my experience has been that past behavior is an important criteria in speculation about future behavior. Where that evidence is weak, it's the examiner's role, I think, to try to ferret that out and to discuss in front of the court or with the court what the limitations of the evidence might be. The other part that I think the examiner can bring to the table, whereas other people may not, is to clarify for the court what the nexus is between the psychiatric symptoms and the risk of danger. That can occur in a number of ways. One is through questioning of witnesses as you develop things. and Another may simply be in in the summarization that the examiner will be asked to do at the end, whether that's in written or oral form or both. One of the things that I think is important for the court to understand, depending on the case in front of it, is what the role of intent is in terms of danger to self and danger to others. Sometimes intent plays a very significant role in that the individual demonstrates and or states a particular intention to cause harm to themselves or to someone else. And then the question then becomes, what's the motivation to follow through with that intent? And how is that demonstrated in terms of planning, fantasizing, stalking, whatever the case may be, in terms of danger to others? Or is it a large group of people that one is being identified as potentially at risk? Could it be a random person that they encounter under certain circumstances? Or is it a very specific individual that they have more of an obsessive kind of relationship with? And so clarifying for the court who might be at risk and under what circumstances that risk is going to take place and what does the history of that individual tell us about going forward, what the court could expect if this person left their court without any treatment, without any supervision, what would happen next relative to that risk. There are other clinical scenarios where intent doesn't play a role in the risk of danger to self and danger to others. Examples of that would be somebody who is being compelled through a delusional process or hallucinations to carry out certain behaviors, and their understanding of those behaviors is radically different than them thinking they're going to cause harm, or that they're carrying out a particular purpose that is being pre-designed for them that they must follow or harm will occur. 
is another way of putting this. And so understanding the person's particular relationship to their experience is what helps flesh out where that risk is and how it's going to possibly show up out in the community. And that requires having more knowledge about that person other than just a description of symptoms and their history, so to speak, to understand their relationship to those symptoms. And that's something I think that the examiner can play a role in terms of uh, clarifying and identifying for a person in regards to a person's particular presentation. I just wanted to make sure I was clarifying for our listeners. So I think in the conversation we've had before, Terry, how you explained it to me was that I may not intend to hurt my mom, but I may be having symptoms where I don't think that's my mom. I think that is a doppelganger or something else who's going to hurt me. Mm -hmm. So I don't see myself as hurting my mom. I see myself as hurting that doppelganger. So if you were to ask me if I had any ill intent towards my mother, I would say no. Right. But that doesn't mean that my mom isn't in danger because I don't see that as my mom. Am I understanding our conversation about intent versus doing harm? That's exactly right. That's a great example. I've seen a number of those situations where the individual is experiencing um, hallucinations and delusions such that they don't perceive the reality in the way that we do. And as a result of that distortion in their reality perception, what they are doing in their mind is acting in the best interest of whoever it is they're caring for, but their actions will result in harm. And so they will not express an intent. And if you look only at that kind of an expression as a reason for going forward with a civil commitment, you will miss in some cases the real risk because it doesn't involve an intent to harm so much as it it results in harm because of their illness. You're talking about kind of the rationality component of a person's functioning. Another important component to consider with dangerousness is impulsivity. So when an individual is in a highly reactive, agitated state, their reasoning for behavior may not be the primary driving force. And if that is the case, then... I think the examiner's role is partly to to demonstrate that, if at all possible, to the court. And this would most likely occur, if it doesn't happen on its own for the court to observe, if the examiner has the opportunity to question the examinee at hearing. It's not that I think the person should be provoked, but asking relevant questions and sensitive questions about sensitive materials may evoke the kind of response that you want the court to know about. What their level of impulsivity is, what their frustration tolerance might be. And if they have the capacity to sit through a court hearing, remaining calm, remaining interactive, that's instructive to the court as well. Mm-hmm. Thank you for adding that. I think that's a really important piece. So in the time that we have left, I'm wondering if you have any last thoughts for our listeners or want to talk about anything that we didn't get a chance to talk about. There's an element of informed consent that must occur when you're encountering the examinee to let them know your role and what might happen. I also think it's incumbent upon the examiners to explain their role as a friend of the court and that material developed within the examination is not confidential, and that will be included in any subsequent report that the examiner develops. If the person is willing to go forward at that point, the opportunity arises to use statements that the the person makes in the one-on-one examination at the hearing later on. My goal is to help the court understand the thought processes of the individual. The court gets firsthand knowledge of just what their thought processes and and beliefs are and can help to make that nexus between those symptoms and potential acts of violence, acts of self-harm, and ability to make rational decisions about their own health and safety. Terry, any last thoughts from you? It's been my experience over many 
years of doing this work for court hearings and providing testimony and listening to testimony and seeing how these processes play out, and not in just in Oregon, but other states as well, is that every one of these hearings is a microcosm of the complexity that we face when we are trying to understand at what point does society need to take a role in preventing somebody's harm due to a person suffering from a mental disorder. And it is a very complex, multi-layered, nuanced experience. These are oftentimes not easy calls to make for anybody. It is not easy for families to provide testimony. It is challenging, I think, also for other people who come in, law enforcement, medical professionals, social workers, therapists, friends of the family, whoever it may be, even folks who just happen to be part of what happened are brought into these court hearings. And it can be extremely intimidating and challenging. And then you have the individual who is suffering from a mental disorder trying to sort through at the time when their illness is at its peak, essentially, to understand what is happening all around him or her and to participate in a dialogue about themselves. All of this is a very complex thing, and I think everybody is working in some fashion towards the best interest of that person in the way they understand it. I think that the examiner plays just a central role in formulating and pulling together all of those dynamics into a coherent messaging for the court in a way that the court can better understand what their right choice should be. And it, again, is always going to be up to the court to determine what that is. But the examiner plays just a central role in helping to provide that kind of clarity and detail that the court needs in order to know what is within their authority to do and not do. And then they make a decision based on their own understanding of all of that, of course. And it's just my deepest respect for everybody who plays these roles in these hearings. And I just want to say that I have a great deal of gratitude for everybody who's trying to do the right thing under what is basically a very messy and complicated process. Well said, Terry. Well said. Well said. And I think that is the perfect note to end our podcast on. Thank you so much, Jeff and Terry, for your time today and your insights. We really appreciate it. And I really appreciate it chatting with you. Thank you. Always a pleasure. Thank you so much, Chris. Thank you, Jeff. And thank you, Terry. The Center Collaborative is a production of the Oregon Center on Behavioral Health and Justice Integration, a specialized division of Greater Oregon Behavioral Health Incorporated. It is produced by me, Chris Thomas, with production assistance from Patrick Kennedy. Music by Patrick Mulvihill and Patrick Kennedy. Subscribe to the Center Perspective using your favorite app. To learn more about criminal justice and behavioral health in Oregon, visit the Center's website at ocphji.org. You can also find us on Facebook. We'd love to hear from you. Please reach out to us. Join us next time as we chat with the experts about programs and partnerships at work within this complex and yet compelling field.